My name is Todd Hera. Um, I'm, I'm a funeral director and embalmer. Uh, I work for the family business in Wilmington, Delaware, and I've been working for uh, the family business for almost two decades now. Uh, but my family history goes back a lot farther than that. Um, my great, great, great grandfather was what was known as a tradesman undertaker in Milford, Delaware. Uh, so, so my family's been doing this for uh, many, many years. Um, and that's kind of what sparked my entry, interest in the history of uh, funeral service. Uh, essentially, why do we bury our dead the way we do? So uh, I'm going to go through that with you this evening and talk about uh, the historic underpinnings of the traditional American funeral. Okay, so the day Virginia held a referendum to ratify their article, Articles of Succession, that night a man by the name of Captain John Smead uh, led three handpicked companies of the Washington National Rifles over the Long Bridge. And this was the bridge that separated Washington from Virginia. And there on the other side, he met some very brief resistance from Confederate pickets, uh, but drove them back into the woods and essentially established the bulwark for what would be the Union invasion of Virginia. Now on the other side of Washington, and this is pictured here on the grounds of the Lunatic Asylum, was encamped the first fire zouabs, um, also the 11th New York uh, Regiment. And they were led by uh, this man, Colonel Elmer Ellsworth. And while uh, Smead had created the bulwark for the land invasion, uh, Ellsworth, he handpicked three companies from the fire zouabs, and they uh, boarded two gunboats, the Baltimore and the Mount Vernon, and sailed down the Potomac, uh, arriving at Alexandria uh, just at daybreak. Now, when they arrived in Alexandria, uh, Ellsworth, he jumped off the boat and ran up King Street and immediately secured the telegraph office. Now, when he came out of the telegraph office, across the street was an inn called the Marshall House. And on top of the Mar Marshall House flew a uh, Confederate flag, a secessionist flag, that was so large, it was said that it could be seen from the executive mansion, the White House, uh, on a clear day with field glasses. Now, this huge flag flew atop a 40-foot pole. And uh, spying the flag, Ellsworth said to his entourage, he said, that flag's got to come down, boys. And across King Street, they dashed into the Marshall House. Now, when they got into the Marshall House, uh, he went up to the clerk and uh, said, how do I get to the roof? And the clerk just looked at him blankly. And Elser said, this is no matter, I'll find it myself. And him and his entourage uh, raced up the stairs to the roof. Now, the uh, clerk of the inn immediately went into the back room and woke up the innkeeper, a man by the name of James Jackson. And Jackson was a, a rather nasty figure who uh, had a penchant and a taste for violence. Um, he once nearly beat a priest to death who insulted him. And when the priest went and told the sheriff, reported this assault to him, the sheriff rounded up a posse and went to Jackson's house. And Jackson had barricaded himself in his house and him and his brothers opened fire on the sheriff's posse and the, the sheriff essentially threw up his hands and said you know an assault char charge is not worth my life so so jackson has this history of violence he's an ardent secessionist and he's getting woken up by his clerk telling him there's federal troops on his roof taking down his flag well, Jackson doesn't hesitate, and he grabs his shotgun and run for his, runs for the stairs. Now, just as um, Jackson reaches the stairs, he encounters Ellsworth coming down the stairs with his entourage, and Ellsworth has the secessionist flag draped around his shoulders, almost like a cape. And his plan was to tear strips of this off and give it to his men as a souvenir from the day. So Jackson doesn't hesitate and unloads one of the barrels of his shotgun point blank range into Ellsworth's chest, killing him immediately. Now, one of the men in Ellsworth's entourage, uh, a private by the name of Francis Brownell, um, 
takes aim with his sharps rifle and before Jackson has a uh, chance to unload a second barrel, shoots him through the head. And as the Philadelphia Inquirer would later report, splattering his brains all about. And then he took his uh, rifle and um, pinned Jackson's body to the staircase with his bayonet. So here in a matter of one or two seconds, we have two things happening uh, that are kind of pivotal in the Civil War. Uh, the first, Ellsworth was the first Union officer casualty of the Civil War. And Brownell's actions would later earn him a Congressional Medal of Honor. So this is the first action during the war that merited a Congressional Medal of Honor. Now, back in Washington, uh, news reaches uh, the city very quickly that uh, Ellsworth has been killed uh, via the secure telegraph office. And um, there is an enterprising physician there uh, by the name of Dr. Thomas Holmes, who has a very unusual skill set. He knows how to embalm the dead. And he hears of uh, Ellsworth being killed and rushes over to the White House. See, Holmes has an ally in William Seward, the Secretary of State. They're both New Yorkers, and uh, Holmes had made his acquaintance. And he gets Seward to get him an audience with the president. And when they find the president, he's in his second story um, library, and he's in tears. Ellsworth had been uh, President Lincoln's law clerk back in Springfield, and they were good friends. And in fact, Ellsworth had acted as Lincoln's bodyguard on his inaugural train ride to Washington. And Holmes goes in and he says, you know, Mr. President, I would like your permission to embalm Ellsworth. And the president looks at him and he says, you know, I, I, I don't know what embalming is. I can't give you permission for this. And Holmes tells him, he says, you must give me permission. Um, if his parents are to see him again. Now see, at this time, the only way the railroads would ship dead bodies were if they were embalmed or if they were placed in a sealing metallic casket. Now think about it, you know, wartime production is ramping up and uh, all metal is being diverted to make weapons and ammunition. So uh, there was really only one coffin on the market at that point. Um, it was based off the Fisk patent, um, and it was made by two manufacturers, one in Cincinnati and one in Queens. And if you could get your hands on one of these Fisks, they were extremely expensive. So the president relents and gives Holmes permission to embalm Ellsworth. And so Holmes rushes to uh, where he's staying, grabs his grip, boards an omnibus, and heads for the Washington Navy Yard. And Ellsworth's body is already making its way back up the Potomac on a uh, side paddle boat called the James Gray. Now, once his remains are brought back in to the Navy Yard, they're placed in the engine house. And this is very symbolic uh, because the first fire Zoabs, Ellsworth recruited all these soldiers and he recruited them. Uh, they're all firemen. And his theory was, you know, firemen run towards danger. You know, when a building's burning, they have no fear. They're going to run and help people. So uh, in battle, they won't run from the danger. They'll run towards it. Um, so his, his body is taken to the engine house, and that's where, you know, the fire apparatus of the day would have been housed. And um, Holmes gets to work after the autopsy of um, embalming Colonel Ellsworth. Now, Shortly into the operation, a uh, black carriage arrives and uh, Mrs. Lincoln is inside and she wants to see Ellsworth and she's turned away because she's a woman. It would be very indecorous of her to, um, you know, see a man in such a condition, you know, a surgical operation like this. Um, and so she's turned away and about an hour later, the carriage returns and it's Mrs. Lincoln again, but this time she has the president. And the president is admitted to see his dear friend and he asked the honor guard, he says, before he's shipped home, um, would you do me the honor of bringing him to uh, the White House for a funeral ceremony? And so Ellsworth's remains are brought up and laid out in the East Room. 
and about 600 uh, politicians and high-ranking military officials all gather uh, in the East Room for this funeral ceremony before Ellsworth is sent home. And if you think about, you know, people of that time, it's 1861, uh, people, they laid out and they buried their dead from home. And so these were people that were accustomed to the sights, sounds, and smells of their dead. And they knew, you know, a lot of these people were were farmers, they, they were military men, they had experience with hunting, and they knew what a point blank range shotgun blast would do and how quickly the remains would start to decompose after, afterwards. And here's Ellsworth, dressed in his uniform, looking very peaceful. And in fact, Mrs. Lincoln leans over to her husband and she says, he looks natural. He looks like he's only sleepy. So let's, let's keep that statement in mind as we move forward. Um, Thomas Holmes would go, um, would continue on throughout the war, um, and he would embalm a total of 4,028 soldiers and officers during the course of the war. Holmes is, uh, who is regarded as the father of modern embalming. Now, uh, this technique was brought to uh, America in 1840, a Philadelphia physician by the name of Richard Harlan, uh, he went over and he was studying sanitary technique on the continent, and he met this um, gentleman by the name of Ganal. And two years er earlier, Jean Nicholas Ganal, who was a French chemist, had written a book on embalming and published it. And Harlan was so impressed. He was an anatomist, um, and he was looking for ways to, um, you know, preserve his specimens for anatomical study. And he was so impressed that he translated this book into English and to say it was a flop would be a huge understatement. In America, nobody cared, okay? Um, the book sold just a few, few copies at that time and uh, embalming remained essentially, um, you know, unknown, untalked about in America. Now, Back in France, um, Ganal was kind of the undisputed embalmer. He embalmed all the rich and the famous. It was very uh, fashionable to call Ganal to have your loved one embalmed. Well, he was um, challenged by this doctor by the name of Jean-Pierre Souquet. And Souquet uh, said he had come up with a superior method of embalming. And in 1845, these two engaged in kind of a grisly little competition before the French Academy of Sciences where they each embalmed a body in front of uh, these physicians and then they buried it for 14 months. And after 14 months, the bodies were dug up and Souquet's was the one that showed no signs of uh, decomposition. Now, Ganau was using uh, aluminum acetate and aluminum sulfate to embalm, and Souquet had come up with uh, this concoction that was zinc chloride. Now, why is this important to this story? Uh, this is important because uh, Souquet promptly sent uh, an agent to America uh, to try to license the use of uh, his embalming methodology and a uh, doctor, actually a dentist in Manhattan by the name of uh, Dr. Charles Brown, uh, bought the rights to use his process, uh, Souquet's process, here in America. And um, I'm going to kind of pause there for a moment, but it'll be important uh, here in, in just a second as to uh, why uh, that is important. Now, this is uh, a famous photograph. This is Dr. Richard Burr. He was a very prolific Civil War embalmer. Uh, this photo was thought to be taken at Camp Letterman after Gettysburg. Um, and then here to the left, you have uh, William Bennell, who is actually Thomas Holmes's brother-in-law, his embalming shed at Fredericksburg, Virginia. And then over here on the right, you have Drs. Chamberlain and Lyford. Uh, again, this photo was taken at Camp Letterman at Gettysburg. Now, it's interesting to note that the two gentlemen standing upright in the coffin, uh, those are live soldiers. They were offered the exciting prospect of having their picture made, and obviously they took it. So uh, during the Civil War, uh, embalming kind of takes off. This is the only way, if, 
if you wanted to get your loved one home that uh, you could, uh, although it's estimated that only about 6% 6 of the 650,000 uh, soldiers that perished were embalmed and able to be shipped home. So that's a, a soberingly small number. Now, just nine months after um, Ellsworth is uh, killed in kind of the spectacular fashion, a calamity rocks the White House and the Lincoln's beloved child, uh, William Wallace Lincoln, succumbs to typhoid, okay? Now, think about what Mrs. Lincoln said to her husband. He looks peaceful. He looks like he's only sleeping. So the Lincolns take kind of the very unusual step and call for an embalmer to have their son embalmed. Now, this is something that was not done typically for funereal purposes. The only time it was being done now was out of necessity for soldiers that needed to be shipped home. People were not just embalming their loved ones to lay them out to be viewed. So this is this kind of marks uh, almost a watershed case of, of uh, you know, an embalmer being called in uh, to embalm for funereal purposes. And the man that was called in was a man by the name of Henry Cattell. Uh, he worked for Dr. Charles Brown. And he was using the Suquet method of uh, embalming. And you ask, why wasn't Holmes um, summoned to the White House, uh, especially given Lincoln's prior experience with the embalmer? Um, I don't know for a fact, but my best guess is that uh, the embalmers would follow the armies around uh, on their campaigns and a lot of time embalm right there uh, at the battlefield, as you saw Richard Byrd doing. So my best guess is Holmes was uh, out in the field embalming and unavailable to be called. And down here at the bottom, this is a, a, an example of a uh, fisk. Now these had kind of fallen out of vogue by the time of the Civil War, uh, but this is the, the mummiform coffin that was airtight and could be used to ship on the railroad. Uh, but by the time uh, Willie Lincoln died, uh, they, they were using something that would look more like a regular coffin at this time. So fast forward another three years um, after uh, Willie dies of typhoid, and we're at Ford's Theater. And, um, you know, inexplicably, John Parker decides to go next door for a drink at Tadaval's Saloon, uh, leaving the state, bar, state box completely unguarded and allowing John Wilkes Booth to sneak in and assassinate the president. Um, it was President Lincoln's funeral that kind of set the stage for American funerals for the next 150 years and what I'm calling the traditional American funeral uh, because as we know, traditions constantly change, but these are the elements that uh, I, I'm saying constitute the traditional American funeral. But in order to best understand the uh, kind of how Lincoln's funeral affected the, uh, the landscape, the, the culture, uh, I think it's important to look back into kind of the early American funeral experience. Now, the average um, colonial family had 8.8 uh, .8 children. Uh, of those, 5.9 lived to adulthood. Uh, the average lifespan in 17th century Salem was 29 for males and a whopping 20 years for females. So I tell you this to uh, kind of drive home the point that I said earlier, that Americans had a very frequent and close relationship with their dead at this time. Um, remains were laid out in the home, the family would wash them, they would dress them, the families would dig the graves. Uh, so they were, again, very um, used to the sights, sounds, and smells of death. And the early American funeral was based on uh, the 1644 Directory for the Public Worship of God, which stated, uh, remains be decently attended from the house to the place appointed for public burial, and there immediately interred without any ceremony. So a funeral was not what it is today. There was no ceremony. The remains would be washed and taken to the place of burial. 
So I'm going to kind of walk through the elements of the early American funeral. The first uh, would be the wake. And it was called that because the families would literally sit there and um, watch for the person to wake up. People at this time and for centuries prior to this were um, terrified of and very uh, acute of uh, premature burial. People were very scared of this uh, because there was no reliable way to tell if death had occurred. Um, sure, there was a lot of what we would now call inexpert tests uh, where they would um, maybe place a mirror in front of the mouth to tell if there was fogging. Uh, the ligature test, where you tie a piece of ligature around the tip of the finger to see if it turns a different color, injecting ammonia under the skin. Um, and then there was kind of some more barbaric methods, uh, plunging a needle into uh, a muscle to see if the person would flinch, uh, the application of irritating mustard plasters, dripping of hot wax on uh, the person's skin. And then there was some downright bizarre uh, methods. A Dr. Uh, Laborde suggested the rhythmical traction of the tongue for two hours to see if somebody was in a trance or catalepsy. Now, it wasn't until um, 1816 that a French doctor by the name of René Lenac uh, invented the stethoscope. Um, and then in 1846, the French Academy of Sciences was putting on a contest called the pre to uh, for anyone that could come up with a reliable way to determine if death had occurred. And at that time, a doctor by the name of uh, Eugene Bouchot uh, put forth using uh, Linnaeus' stethoscope uh, to determine the cessation of heartbeat as a reliable method of determining death. Now, uh, he did win the prize, although not all physicians uh, at the time agreed with him. Um, some actually kind of mocked and derided his suggestion. But, you know, it's, it's um, kind of interesting to think, you know, looking at it from the 21st century, that you wouldn't use a stethoscope to determine if death had occurred. So until then, families would literally sit around and watch to see if the person woke or once decomposition set in, that was the only reliable way they knew, yes, my loved one is dead, they can now be buried. Casketed remains. Um, we pull a lot in our American funeral traditions from uh, the English funeral tradition. The English funeral tradition at the time was a shrouded burial. Uh, parishes what would have what was called a parish coffin when somebody died, the remains were shrouded at home, they were taken from their home to the cemetery in the parish coffin, they were buried shrouded and the um, parish coffin was taken back to the church to await the next death. Now, uh, there's a, a doctor by the name of Brent Tharp, he is the um, director of the Georgia Southern Museum, and he theorizes that um, it was actually a, a resource issue why Americans from the get-go used coffins, whereas their English counterparts uh, were buried and shrouded. It, you think about it, it makes sense. Uh, the English had kind of a, they had a finite landmass, they're on an island, they had a mature population, and wood was valuable. It was needed for uh, cooking, for uh, building shelter, for building military weapons, so wood was a precious resource in England. The settlers, they come to America, and they're greeted with a seemingly infinite supply of wood. And, and that's why uh, it's theorized that from the first burials, the earliest burials that have been unearthed in America, uh, almost all of them are encoffined. Um, and even enslaved people, um, you, you find a lot of the, the uh, they were buried in coffined. So casketed uh, remains uh, were certainly a mainstay of the American funeral tradition from the get-go. Uh, a carpenter or cabinet maker would be called and a custom coffin would be made for each individual. There would be a procession from the place of death to the cemetery. Um, as you can see here, the gentlemen in the hats, they're the pallbearers. They are literally holding the tassel of the pall to keep it on the uh, coffin. The legs underneath, those are the underbearers. Those are the young men in the town that would actually be bearing the weight of the uh, coffin. Uh, then we begin to see things shift uh, into the 
graveside and funeral services get added um, into American funerals. Uh, the first instance we see of a funeral service, or one of the first, is in uh, 1683. Uh, it's for a pastor by the name of Elam Adams in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Um, and then one of the first gravesides recorded was for uh, a man by the name of Waitstill Winthrop in 1717. Um, he had fame as being the one of the magistrates for the Salem witch trials. Now, this these last two pieces of colonial funerals are really what... Um, drove the cost up. Um, the repast, uh, the colonial travel traveler was expected to be um, refreshed. Uh, you know, they were traveling uh, often dangerous roads over uh, for them what would be very treacherous, um, you know, long distances, and they expected their host to, um, you know, provide them shelter and um, uh, food uh, for attending the funeral service. And people are expected to put out their finest stuff, um, you know, hogs, sugar, um, geese, you know, all, all these things that would be delicacies in the colonial era. Uh, families who are expected to put out uh, their best food and drink during this time. Uh, this is one of the few occasions uh, that drinking was actually um, allowed or uh, condoned in uh, colonial America. Was the uh, was the funeral, and in fact, the uh, author Nathaniel Hawthorne remarked uh, that funerals were one of the only class of scenes, as far as my investigation has taught me, in which our ancestors were wont to steep their tough old hearts in wine and strong drink, and the occasional outbreak of grisly jollity. Um, and we see evidence of just how much uh, booze was consumed at these funerals. Uh, Philip Livingston was a uh, New York merchant. He died in 1749, and the family opened a pipe of wine. And a pipe is a barrel size of 126 gallons. And they opened a pipe of wine at his uh, city house and also at his manor house. Uh, the total funeral bill for Mr. Livingston's uh, funeral came to 500 pounds. Now, to put that uh, in perspective, um, a bricklayer who would be one of the highest paid tradesmen of the day um, in 1749 would make about six shillings a day. So it would take about 4.5 years for the average layman to pay for such a lavish funeral. And we also see funeral gifts adding to the crippling expense of colonial funerals. Um, Families were um, encouraged to provide dual or give something in grief. And so we see uh, colonial families giving out luxury goods to people that came to uh, the funeral. And these would include uh, rings, scarves, gloves, books, bottles of wine, um, you know, and, and the expense for these uh, became uh, just, you know, massive. Um, we see funeral bills that uh, sometimes would be as much as one-fifth of the total value of somebody's estate in the colonial period because of the uh, food, drink, and gifts they were uh, required to give folks. And there was um, an adage of the time that when a baby was born, the parents should start stockpiling wine, either for their wedding or their funeral. Now, these gifts... Um, and I have this one here. Uh, this is actually uh, the earliest dated example uh, in America. 1693 was made by Jeremiah Dummer, who was a uh, jeweler in Boston on the occasion of uh, the death of James Lord. And it is on display at Winter Museum in um, Wilmington, Delaware. And uh, the kind of the excess, this funeral excess, led to starts starting to, excuse me, states starting to enact sumptuary laws, um, banning the giving of funeral gifts um, in an effort to kind of rein these expenses in. Uh, and the first one we see in 1741, uh, Massachusetts uh, enacts a law that is uh, prohibiting families from giving funeral gifts. 
So that's kind of the uh, colonial uh, funeral experience in a very small nutshell. And um, so, so jumping back, uh, fast forwarding to uh, after Lincoln was assassinated and kind of the events that unfolded that led to uh, the creation of um, what I'm calling the traditional American funeral. Um, we've kind of already been through uh, the embalming, but I do think it's interesting to note, uh, this is a picture of uh, Henry Cattell in uh, his later years. Um, at the time Lincoln was assassinated and taken back to the White House, it is documented that the, when the messenger arrived at uh, Brown and Alexander, the embalmers, um, Dr. Brown was at the establishment and he sent Henry Cattell alone to the White House to embalm the President of the United States. Now, Henry was 26 years old at the time. And unlike a lot of the embalmers operating in Washington, um, he was one of the few that was not a medical doctor. He had learned this skill from Dr. Brown. And it, you know, it just, it, it kind of uh, amazes me. You know, I think of what I was doing at 26 and uh, this young man is called to the White House to uh, perform such a task. And he did it well. Um, the president would um, be viewed by 880,000 people. About 3% of the population of America viewed the president as he went on his 11 stop funeral tour over the next two and a half weeks. And the sentiment of the public was, if it's good enough for the president, it's good enough for my family. Um, and again, you know, I hate to kind of kick a dead horse, but um, going back to, you know, Americans were very familiar with, um, you know, death and dying and what happened to their dead once they died as far as, you know, what decomposition looked like. And as we see the funeral train getting on to its later stops in, you know, Chicago and then finally in Springfield, uh, these people, they know the president has been dead for two weeks plus, and they're able to approach the coffin and look at him and he looks perfectly normal. And, you know, to people at this time, it was almost like, um, you know, Henry Cattell had done a magic trick. And, you know, going back, people saw that and they said, well, I want this for my family too. And after the war, we kind of see, um, you know, this is when embalming um, starts to take off. It's, it's a little bit slow at first, but um, kind of by the, the end of the 19th century, um, it was almost standard for uh, almost every American to be embalmed when they passed. Uh, the other thing that that changed, uh, or I should say was magnified by Lincoln's death and his funeral, uh, were the use of flower tributes. Now, flowers have always been something that have been offered um, at funerals. Um, even dating back to Neanderthal times, um, Dr. Ralph Solecki, uh, when he excavated the Shandahar Cave in Iraq, um, found a Neanderthal that was surrounded by uh, pollen spores and um, surmises that um, you know flower offerings were laid around this person. And you think about it, it's, it's a very natural human impulse to surround um, the ugliness of death, if you will, with something as beautiful and vibrant as flowers. Um, but, but that's, people were pretty much going out into their garden and picking a bouquet and bringing it to a funeral. It was as simple as that in colonial times. Um, and, and then we have Lincoln's funeral and we see these grand floral displays. This is actually a picture of a stop. This is in Michigan City, Indiana. And it's very hard to tell from these photos, but those pillars, as the newspaper reported, were adorned with the flowers from hundreds hundreds of local gardens. And then here we have um, to the left, this is uh, Lincoln's catafalque where his casket would be, his, excuse me, his coffin would be laid um, in Columbus. Um, it, as you can see, it's basically made of flowers. Uh, the, the city was going for something that was very pastoral 
looking. Um, and they wanted to surround him with flowers and uh, the lilacs were in bloom and the thought was when the coffin would be laid on it, it would crush the flowers and release a pleasing scent. Uh, here on the right, we have um, the tr Lincoln's funeral train as it's uh, parked in Philadelphia. And it was reported that as the train approached the city limits, people had gathered trackside and piled so many flowers onto the train tracks that the train almost stalled. Now think about that, how many flowers you would need to pile on train tracks to stall something as big and powerful and heavy as a train. And, and this, this was, you know, Americans' way of showing solidarity and, and a way of expressing grief. And, um, and, and then you start to see, you know, okay, flowers are offered at the president's funeral. Well, we're going to start sending flowers to our friend's funeral, our family's funeral, um, and you also see the kind of the advent or the creation of uh, set pieces during Lincoln's funeral. And these are flowers that are arranged to look like something else. Now, for example, uh, when Lincoln was laid out in the East Room in the White House, there was a cross of lilies um, that was at the head of the coffin. And then throughout the train journey um, that followed, uh, civic groups and, um, you know, community groups would board the train and they would bring in flowers that were arranged to look like things patriotic, you know, an anchor. Lincoln was the anchor of the Union, um, you know, a shield or a star. Um, so again, people um, start seeing these flowers arranged like something else. And after Lincoln's coffin would leave uh, a city location, uh, the flowers would remain in place uh, for several days afterwards and the public would continue to file through that place to look at the flowers that were on display when the president was at that location. Uh, the visibility of the hearse. Now, until this time, the hearse was something that was almost uh, frivolous. Yeah, think about the colonials scratching out, um, you know, a, kind of a, an existence in this very tough new world and a specialized vehicle for the dead was, um, you know, frivolous. It wasn't needed. And um, in addition to that, they didn't need one because they were burying folks on their own property in the churchyards and the town commons, typically all distances that were very easy to walk to. Uh, think back to that previous slide I showed you with the pallbearers. Uh, the pallbearers would simply carry the remains from the house to the place of burial. Um, Coupled with the Lincoln funeral, we see um, the advent of the rural cemetery, uh, a cemetery that is outside of the city, the hustle and bustle of the city. Um, and, and so we start to see cemeteries that are five, six, seven miles outside of the cities, and thus we need transportation to um, transport the dead. Uh, the thing that Lincoln's funeral did was bring all this to the forefront of people's thoughts. Uh, every city, almost every city, created a custom hearse for the occasion, each city trying to outdo the other. Uh, this here is the hearse that was used in Washington, D.C. Um, it was built by um, Richard Harvey. And um, next here, this slide, this is the hearse that was built in um, New York City. And it was so massive, it was pulled by 16 horses. Now, this man, Peter Relia, he was a, uh, a sexton undertaker in New York City. Uh, he was a carpenter by trade, and the Board of Aldermen came to him um, 72 hours before Lincoln was due to arrive in New York and tasked him with building, um, you know, a, a hearse to represent uh, the city. And Relia, he hired um, 60 workers, they worked around the clock for the next three days to create this um, stunning masterpiece um, that conveyed Lincoln's remains. It was uh, 14 feet long, eight feet wide, and 15 feet high. Uh, I also like to point out that if you look at um, Raleigh's business card, uh, Undertaker for the President, New York, April 26, I don't know if this was a typo, the printer got it wrong or Raleigh got confused, but Lincoln's body uh, left New York on April 25th. So I've never been able to solve uh, that little mystery. And 
Um, the hearse that Relia built for the city of New York, um, he charged them $9,000. So that would be about $165,000 in today's money. So uh, these, these creations that the cities were paying for certainly weren't cheap. Uh, here's another example of a hearse. This uh, was in Chicago. And um, the man in the upper right-hand corner, Collins uh, Jordan, uh, this funeral kind of propelled him into fame. He became the carriage trade undertaker for the city of Chicago. And uh, and then when the mayor of Chicago was uh, assassinated uh, during the World's Fair, I don't know if any of you have read Devil in a White City, uh, but when um, Harrison was assassinated, uh, uh, Collins Jordan handled that funeral. Now, I circled that uh, just to, to show you how um, you know, intricate these hearses were created. Uh, this is a, an eagle that was shot over Michigan for the occasion and stuffed for Lincoln's hearse. And then I had just circled these, um, these arches. These were built custom by the city to receive Lincoln's remains. Um, they were 26 feet wide at, in the center arch and 24 feet high. So, you know, these cities were spending an inordinate amount of money to uh, funeralize the president. This is uh, the only hearse that was not custom built for the occasion. Uh, this hearse was used in Springfield. Springfield decorated uh, the town and then realized, oh my gosh, we've run out of money. Uh, we don't have any money to build a hearse. So the mayor of uh, St. Louis generously offered to uh, donate a hearse. And so this hearse was brought in. It was uh, owned by a man by the name of Jesse Arnaud, who had a livery service in um, St. Louis. And uh, this hearse um, burned up in a fire uh, several years later. Um, it was a fire that killed four people and 18 horses. Um, and at the time, uh, the hearse burned about 20 years later, uh, Arnaud said that um, the hearse had never been used on a funeral since. Uh, this is the factory where uh, the Springfield hearse was built. Uh, Billy Rogers uh, in Philadelphia built the hearse. Uh, when it was new, it was uh, $4,000. Uh, I just put this in. This might be interested. Anyone that wants to jot this URL down. Uh, there's a funeral home in Springfield that uh, recreated this hearse. The only surviving photograph of the hearse is the one I just showed you. And they essentially uh, reverse engineered the hearse based on that surviving photograph uh, for the 150 year anniversary of Lincoln's death. And I have seen this hearse in person and it is absolutely phenomenal. They used all um, uh, period techniques and craftsmanship to uh, build this hearse. And it, it, it is just really a work of art. Um, we've got the emphasis of the casket and coffin. Again, using a coffin was not something new, uh, but as far as the ornateness of it, uh, Lincoln's coffin was a cut above. Um, it was custom built. It was black walnut covered in black broadcloth lined in lead and um, had a satin interior. Uh, it was uh, built by an undertaker named Jacob Weaver in Baltimore and trimmed at the undertaking establishment of Harvey and Mark, meaning they put the lining in it, they put all these um, kind of decorations, the nail heads, the uh, escutcheons, the silver handles on the outside of it. And millions and millions of people saw this coffin paraded through the streets um, and, you know, again, the thought became that, you know, I no longer want to settle for kind of this rude coffin knocked together by the town's um, cabinet maker, carpenter, you know, I want something grand like the president had. And, uh, you know, we see not only uh, this demand for caskets and coffins grow, uh, but this is when the Industrial Revolution is starting to kick into gear and um, coffins and caskets begin to get made in factories. Postmortem photography, um, I'm running a little lean on time, so I'm gonna breeze through this. Uh, this is the only surviving photo of President Lincoln. Um, Postmortem photography enjoyed kind of a very brief golden age um, 
basically from Lincoln's assassination until the turn of the 20th century. Um, and, and due to kind of people, uh, the, the rise of the personal camera, people began taking photos of their loved ones when they were alive. Uh, but a lot of times during this kind of 40, 50 year window of the golden era of postmortem photography, um, the only photo families would have a lot of times of their relatives would be one that was taken in death. And uh, the prints of these would be remade. It was big business and uh, sold and mailed to family members. Um, you know, think about how morbid that is uh, to the modern American, but it was uh, natural back then for them to mail out a postmortem photograph uh, to a family member. And um, again, this kind of took root as the public learned that Lincoln's remains had been photographed. And there's a whole story behind this photo. Um, it was uh, ordered destroyed. And this uh, turned up in, uh, I want to say, 1952 in the uh, Bollinger Collection at the University of Iowa. Uh, and this is a wider shot where I had that close up taken from. Um, I had already mentioned the rural cemetery. Uh, this is something that um, kind of took off prior to the Civil War or gained traction. Uh, the Victorians liked the idea of the rural cemetery, kind of a bucolic setting, a peaceful setting to uh, lay their dead outside the hustle and bustle of the, um, of the cities. And, um, you know, President Lincoln only furthered this by himself being buried in a rural cemetery. And he was buried in Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield, Illinois. And he wasn't the first president to be buried in a rural cemetery. Um, John Tyler and uh, Monroe were both buried in rural cemeteries uh, prior to the Civil War. Uh, but during the war, when um, Van Buren died, you know, he was buried in a churchyard. Most Americans were buried during this era. But shortly uh, before Lincoln was assassinated, as, uh, as soon as one or two weeks before uh, Lincoln was, was killed, uh, he said to his wife, he said, uh, mother, and he, he called uh, Mary Todd mother, he said, mother, I'd like to be buried in a quiet place. And the Lincolns had um, attended the opening of this cemetery in Springfield. So naturally, when her husband was assassinated, um, Mrs. Lincoln insisted that he be uh, buried at this rural cemetery, uh, a place she envis envisioned as a uh, quiet place. And, you know, every major city in America uh, at this point boasted a rural cemetery because it had become very fashionable. Uh, the first one being Mount Auburn up in Boston. Um, and then we had, uh, you know, kind of moving your way down the eastern sea seaboard, uh, we had Greenwood, uh, in Brooklyn, Laurel Hill in Philadelphia, uh, Greenmount in Baltimore, Hollywood in Richmond. So uh, this, this, these were places where the Victorians would, um, you know, walk or take carriage rides or picnics on on the weekend. So uh, the the rural cemetery was as much as a recreational destination as it was a place for the repose of the dead. Uh, that's Mount Auburn, the first rural cemetery. It was founded in 1831. And then finally, we have uh, what I call the habiliments of woe, or uh, we see kind of the formalizing of mourning garb in America. Now, uh, we first see, um, you know, Americans are copying everything the English are doing, and uh, Queen Victoria puts on mourning uh, after the death of a royal consort in 1861. And after the death of President Lincoln, uh, Mary Todd puts on mourning garb, and for the next 17 years of her life, uh, she wears black. And after the Civil War, uh, we see, you know, the rules of mourning essentially be formalized. And it all depends on the degree of your kinship, um, how long you would have to wear mourning, and then you could move into half mourning, and then what they would call the lighter sorrows, where instead of black, you could wear mauve or grays. Um, and, and, and I say this is a result of what I call the phantom body crisis. Um, 650 soldiers marched off to war, and most of them never returned. Um, 
you know, they essentially just vanished from their families' lives. And of that 650,000, um, 400, excuse me, 44,000 are still unlocated. And of those located, 42% are unidentified. Um, so it was like America lost an entire generation and wearing mourning became kind of, again, uh, a badge of solidarity and the public would know if somebody was wearing mourning, you know, treat that person with a little bit extra kindness. Um, you know, they're, they're going through something at this time. Now, as far as um, the, the uh, nuts and bolts of the funeral side, um, you know, the changes that occurred um, after Lincoln's funeral, uh, we have professionalization. Um, we see the uh, undertakers get together. And uh, in 1882, they form a national association. And we see state associations quickly form after there. Um, and these associations, they're pushing for uh, educational and ethical standards um, across the board. So we have kind of the codification of um, Undertaker. And it's at this first convention that the term, um, you know, funeral director is kind of first coined and used uh, to describe somebody who is a uh, directs funerals and also does embalmings. Uh, we have the institutionalization of the dead. Now, Americans were also institutionalizing their, um, their sick in hospitals and their elderly in um, convalescent and um, nursing homes, um, but they're also institutionalizing their dead in these newfangled funeral parlors that are boasting these great amenities like, um, you know, electric lighting and um, ample seating. So you're not having to hold funeral ceremonies in you know, your cramped apartment or house. Uh, the, uh, these newfangled funeral parlors, they're also boasting um, prep rooms. So rooms to prepare the dead. So the dead are not being embalmed in their bed in the homes anymore and uh, being laid out on a cooling board until the undertakers come back uh, the next day with the coffin. Uh, this time, we see uh, the advent of the burial vault, and this is a whole other presentation. I could go on for an hour or two about this, but this is in response to the scourge of uh, the resurrectionists or the uh, men that were pilfering graves and supplying medical schools at the time. Uh, World War I, we see another big shift in uh, mourning in America. And uh, again, we have another phantom body crisis, 106,000 doughboys march off to war and just, um, you know, essentially disappear. Uh, we also have the Spanish flu going around. And a lot like what we saw during the COVID pandemic, people were being immediately buried. You know, they got sick and they died and there was no viewing. Um, you know, they would essentially just get the body in the ground as quickly as possible. So we have another lost generation. And just as quickly as Americans adopted mourning garb, they cast it off during World War I. It became a morale issue. Um, nobody wanted to see everyone walking around in black to remind them, you know, their son was on the front line too, that he could be next. Uh, so we see Americans divest themselves of mourning garb, but we see a resurgence of mourning jewelry, uh, especially uh, rings and um, brooches are very popular at this time. And we also see uh, the black weeper or the armband become um, kind of in lieu of the full black regalia that would be the mourning garb. Uh, here's a couple examples. This is uh, hair jewelry. And then down there, uh, we have a uh, mourning ring that has a coffin stone in it. Uh, I just wanted to touch briefly on uh, cremation because obviously cremation um, is is changing the uh, traditional uh, American funeral. Uh, the first cremation took place in 1792. Uh, it was more akin to a, a Roman pyre. And uh, Henry Lawrence was a man that was terrified of being buried alive after um, that fate almost befell his daughter. Um, she was pronounced dead. The family went outside to dig the grave and a storm 
blew in and the baby had been put by an open window and the rain beating in the window on the baby woke her up and um, it, it really uh, scarred this man for life. And as a result, when he died, he ordered uh, his body to be burned. Now, the first modern cremation didn't take place um, until quite some time later. Um, Dr. Lemoyne was a doctor in Washington, Pennsylvania, and he was convinced that um, inhumation or bodies being buried in the ground were contaminating the drinking water. So he built a crematory for his own use. It was not for public use. Now, he was talked into uh, using it uh, for the first time in 1876. Uh, a man by the name of Baron Joseph Henry Louis de Palm died, and he practiced kind of an alternate religion called Theosophy. And uh, the, the uh, creators of Theosophy talked uh, Dr. Lemoyne into uh, using his crematorium. And Dr. Lemoyne actually became the third person to use his own crematorium. Uh, but cremation uh, really didn't take off. Um, by 1900, the cremation rate was still under uh, 1%. Um, it really wasn't until um, the 1960s that we see uh, cremation take off. You know, there's a couple different reasons for that. One would be the publication of uh, Jessica Mitford's uh, book, The American Way of Death, with, which just kind of excoriated the funeral profession. Uh, we see the rise of cremation societies, um, and we also uh, have the, the Catholic, uh, the, the, the Pope publishes a document that essentially uh, allows Catholics to, um, to be cremated for the first time. Um, the cremation rate um, is now, it's, it's actually a little bit higher than this. This is a, um, a slide that I ripped from last year. Uh, it's nationally, it's closer to 60% this year. All right. And then finally, um, you know, I just wanted to touch on the future of uh, funeral service. And uh, this is the, the last slide. Um, you know, when people want to talk about the future of funeral service, typically they want to talk about methods of disposition. Um, you know, burial cremation are the two uh, standard, most popular ones in America now. Um, natural organic reduction, which is also called human composting, is legal in six states now. Uh, there's actually a bill in Delaware. It might be legalized in Delaware during this next legislative session. Uh, alkaline hydrolysis is legal in uh, 22 states. Um, that's sometimes called aquamation or water cremation. Um, essentially, instead of using fire, they're using uh, a basic solution, hot water and pressure to uh, render, um, it looks like cremation ash at the end of the process. And then there's the theoretical promession. Uh, again, that's strictly theoretical at this point, but that's freeze drying. Uh, I think the real kind of interesting future of funeral service lies in, in uh, you know, other avenues than final disposition. Um, death dolls are becoming popular now. Uh, Americans have become so disconnected um, from institutionalizing their, their sick, their dying, and their dead uh, that Death dolls are reconnecting American families with what the dying process actually is. And, uh, you know, that's coupled with the hospice movement where um, more and more Americans are now dying in the comfort of their own homes surrounded by their family members. Uh, funeral celebrants, I would say probably about 50% of the families I meet with are unchurched, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't have a meaningful um, funeral service and funeral celebrants are men and women who create a humanistic service tailored around the person's life um, instead of a religious liturgy. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen some just absolutely beautiful, beautiful uh, funeral services based on um, funeral celebrants delivering them. Uh, the other, I think, very, very interesting thing to watch in funeral service is how uh, the metaverse is going to affect funeral service. Um, I can see maybe at a point by the end of my career, uh, people sitting at home 
on their couch with VR goggles in on meeting in a virtual place to deliver their sympathies to Mr. Jones or Mrs. Smith, um, you know, on a tropical island and, um, you know, sign a virtual guest book. And then, you know, at the end of the experience, pulling the VR goggles on and, uh, you know, they're watching the football game. So uh, I, I think there's there's a lot of interesting things uh, that are we're going to see happening in the metaverse. Um, you know, there, there are already companies out there that are putting together, um, you know, monuments. So, you know, instead of the old stone monument at the cemetery, you know, the norm 100 years down the road might be some sort of unique digital monument. And of course, AI. Um, you know, helping families with uh, creating obituaries, um, as far as clergy members are concerned, composing sermons, and then uh, the creation of eulogies. So, um, folks, that's kind of all I have for you. That's, um, you know, a crash course on uh, the history of funeral service. And if you're interested in learning more, uh, I strongly advise you to um, pick up a copy of my book, Last Rites, The Evolution of the American Funeral, at your local library or anywhere fine books are sold. So thank you for your time.